Hello, everyone, and welcome to panel two of this year's Rethinking Global Development Speaker Series here at ACU. Our theme for today is Innovating Amidst Fragility, Advancing the Power of Informal Labor. Innovating Amidst Fragility connotes an expansive notion that innovation has become critical in the face of increasing global fragility, which we opine goes beyond the breakdown of social coherence. To now include environmental vulnerability and economic shockwaves laced with political tensions. This panel's discussion aims to create a forum where world class leaders uh, from different countries can examine their unique approaches to designing and implementing development solutions in a global system that is increasingly fragile. We seek a deep dive into alternative ideas of innovation, particularly in light of institutions and systems, and not merely technological artifacts. Today, exploration of the topic centers on how informal workers can be engaged as active actors in the solutions being preferred to current global crisis. We see informal workers, who are predominantly women, being disproportionately vulnerable to issues such as forced migration, loss of employment, and lack of social safety. With informal labor being a dominant driver of, of economy and societies, we seek to explore a shift from a reactive response that projects them as primarily marginalized to a proactive approach that focuses on harnessing their intrinsic power. With impacts of global events such as climate change, conflicts, and the COVID-19 pandemic still unfolding, we have an enormous opportunity to rethink how the undertapped potential of informal workers who are dominated by women can be unleashed. It is our hope that today's discussion will serve as a lab wherein ideas are birthed, fused, and distilled into viable strategies, which could be adapted for maximum global impact. Our panelists today are Sara De Wanto. She's the founder, CEO, and managing director of WeTappen, a fintech company providing last mile payment services to the unbanked. Sara was previously Millennium Challenge Account Indonesia's chief financial officer responsible for managing funds aimed at reducing poverty in Indonesia through economic growth. She has also worked for ExxonMobil and Booz Allen Hamilton. We also have Zena Mezer. She's a senior advisor for the International Labor Organization in Lebanon. She began working at ILO as a project manager related to migrant work domestic workers. Zena has more than 20 years of experience in the development sectors. And the areas in the areas of labor migration, gender, and community development. In addition to her professional work, she serves as focal point for the prevention of exploitation and sexual abuse network in the president and the, and the president for the ILO RAS staff union. As a reminder, if anyone on, online has a question, please put it in the chat. We will now begin with a general question for our panelists. Our first general question is, how do fragility and informal labor manifest in the context of your work and the region you are working in? And if you could give us specific examples. So, Sarah, starting with you, why don't you go first and tell us how, how you see fragility in your context? Um, excuse me, I mean, like, your, um, your voice is not very clear. So there's a little bit of an echo. So you asked me, can you repeat the question? Was that to me or was that to the other speaker? Uh, it was to you, no problem. Um, I was asking if you could uh, tell us how you see mm -hmm. fragility in the context of your work and if you can give us specific examples. Fragility? Or are, are you talking about like the informal workers or specifically about their fragility? Well, in the context of your work, if you could um, give us examples on what um, what are the situations that create a unstable um, environment for the people that you work with. So what are the problems, the issues that the people that you work with have to constantly face? And, you know, if you could give specific examples, um, if you would like to talk about the informer workers, that would be great. Okay, um, I'm, uh, so just to uh, clarify here, um, a lot of, uh, so as you mentioned, what I do is um, we create a system that enable last mile uh, digital payment to the unbanked. And keep in mind here, when you're talking about the unbanked in Indonesia, we're talking about the majority of the country. So um, 
about 51% of adults are completely unbanked. So we're talking about like 92 million people. And if you count the unbanked and underbanked, we're talking about almost 76% of all adults in Indonesia. So we're talking about almost 140 million people. So what does this mean? Is that all of these people, they are limited to cash payments, whether it is for receiving cash or for making payments. And that, and if you have a physical ability uh, limitation on making and receiving cash, then your resources in terms of um, potential income or potential person or what or potential suppliers or whatever it is, it is only with people who are within your physical area, the ones that can get actually meet you physically and either give or receive money from you. So what does that mean? If you are in an area that is predominantly poor, then the exchanges can be only between the poor. And it's just the poor and the poor and the ones who can probably actually gain from either the services or the goods that this community brings if they do not have physical access to, uh, then it, it limits that possibility of gaining income from a richer community. So what we do is that we try to eliminate their problem by enabling. So our vision is to enable anyone to make and receive payments anytime, anywhere, no gadget required. So what we created as um, kind of like accounts and systems for people, even though they don't have a bank account, that they can access it through a uh, network of their neighborhood stores around them. So where the neighborhood stores um, can actually receive, uh, I mean, um, where the recipients of these funding, let's say now they can, uh, they are able to sell to somebody else and receive payment, whether it's from aid, whether it's from microloans, or whether it's from buyers of their, like if they sell coffee and then they get payment through digital, what they can do with it is they can actually just access it without having to go to a bank. But then through our system, we enable um, and we empower like the local stores, like the local micro micro stores, um, as a place where they could transact. So they could, uh, everything is facial recognition enabled. So all of the recipients simply have to go to these small stores, show their face, put in their pin and just shop. So it, they're, it's like a credit card, but a cre instead of a credit card, you use your face. Mm -hmm. And instead of uh, putting the pin on the credit card machine, you put it into the merchant's phone. So by this, and they would be able to buy things from their merchant as well as cash out and take money out. So um, these merchants effectively um, act like a store that has digital payment and uh, even act as somewhat of a teller, like a bank teller. Um, and even this is in the middle of, of nowhere. As long as they have some kind of internet connection, that is, uh, we enable them even though in the midst of the jungle, as long as there's internet connection somewhere, they are now able to access the whole, um, like the whole economy, including the digital economy. And this is really important because um, MSMEs are the backbone of the Indonesian economy system, economic system. However, 77% of MSMEs in Indonesia, or about 46 million companies, are also unbanked. So it's not just individuals, it's even companies that are completely unbanked. So this has, what we're doing is an attempt to unleash their power to be able to access the greater, um, a, a bigger market, and even nationally, even though they do not have physical access. Because if we're talking about um, Indonesia and 
uh, we're talking about informal workers, that is basically the majority. It's over 90% are informal if we're talking about the numbers. So with this, it is not, what we're doing is like we're harnessing this, all of these small micro stores, not just um, as a, they're not targets, they're not, but they are the ones who become powerhouses and become enablers for people within their community. Because then just with a little bit of technology, they give access to the over 90% of the people throughout Indonesia. So I'm, it's sorry for a long answer, but hopefully it, it, um, it kind of helps. No, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. And um, Zina, now can you explain um, how fragility manifests in your work? Thanks, uh, Julia. And uh, first of all, I'm honored to be with you. Uh, innovation and informality seems to be kind of buzzwords today in uh, development literature. But in fact, they do carry a real weight because of the impact that they have on more than of more than 60% of the global uh, labor force. So this is why I appreciate a lot uh, being part of this panel and uh, how you are going to kind of come up with strategies to address these challenges. Um, as you mentioned, I work for the ILO and I work mainly on uh, the protection of migrant domestic workers. And um, to start to talk about fragility in the context of uh, my work and for migrant workers, maybe it's important to, to mention just uh, the definition, how, how, what I mean by fragility, it's, when um, you have a group of workers exposed to risks and there is little um, opportunities to manage or mitigate that risk, which put the workers in a very vulnerable situation. Um, in the context of uh, migrant workers and um, especially for migrant women, migrant domestic workers, uh, the fragility has uh, different uh, phases and different faces. There's one aspect of fragility is during the migration process because um, often uh, people become part of the informal sector because of lack of choice, because they don't have access to the formal labor market force. So they go seek opportunities um, into, you know, whatever they can uh, find work. And the decision to migrate is not always uh, an easy decision, especially for women who leave their families behind. And this is something that um, Sarah used the word uh, enablers within their communities. And you see that migrant workers are often enablers to others within their community, either to access health or uh, to access education uh, or even to access food. But that is often on the expense of their own uh, health and uh, and life and pension, etc. So the migration process by itself, with all the complications around recruitment of migrant workers into from um, different continents that have different cultures, different regulations that often do not meet in the middle to provide decent work opportunities for migrant workers. That's one aspect of the challenge. Another aspect is that within the informal sector, when we talk about informality, we mean outside the labor protection. And here it's important to remember that informality does not mean irreg irregular migration. Uh, they are completely different and maybe during the Q&A we can explore this further. So informality is when workers are outside the protection of the labor law, what does that mean? It means they don't have access to uh, pension, to sick leaves, uh, to, uh, to um, access to justice, uh, if, in case there are complaints with, with their employers, um, they also, um, because they are outside the labor law, often informal workers are not able to organize. And when workers don't organize, they lose the power of collective bargaining, which can actually impact uh, impact the whole sector. So they don't have uh, that power. So you see for, for the migrant workers that all of these are challenges that are clearly manifested and that they impact men and women differently 
but when women find themselves more subject to to these vulnerabilities and again we can we can talk uh, more more about that perfect thank you so much um sarah going back to you um you mentioned how majority of the workers in indonesia are informal workers can you tell us a little bit about um the uh, microeconomics characteristics of the country that make it possible to have such a high uh, percentage of informal workers and who are these informal workers? Um, I know we spoke about uh, the fact that in you know a lot of Western countries, informal workers are uh, seen as illegal workers, but clearly that cannot be the case uh, when a country has so many informal workers. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, you're muted. Okay, we're talking about the numbers. There's over 270 million people in Indonesia. Um, guess how much of uh, the population has education above high school, above grade 12? Any wild guesses? Above so high school. Yeah, above high school, above grade 12. How many? 20? Okay, any other guess? More than high school, you mean? Is that what he said? Yes. Oh, yeah, any, like above 30. high school. So 1% of the population. We're going. 20. Okay, 20. 20. We're going to 20. <laughs> You're going with 20. You're almost right. It's two. <laughs> it's two percent so can you imagine in a country where only two percent have the opportunity of getting education beyond high school then of course can you imagine how small i mean like if you go into any office what's the minimum education level probably I think even 12th grade is pretty low, right? It would probably be bachelor's or something. So if the condition is that 98% do not have any kind of education beyond 12th grade, then the only possibility of work is informal work. And there is no shame. There is no, and it's like, no, working in an office is not more, dignified is not more valuable to the community than being a street vendor because then everybody has their own addition to value that they bring to the economy and to others it's just in different forms and then so of course in, in a place like that then it, it's it's different on how somebody would um, describe formal or informal. It's, like it, it's just the economy. People just do it in different ways. And a lot of it is going to be informal because that is the situation and that is what is needed by the rest of the, com uh, by the, rest of the economy. So um, yeah. It's, uh, it's just a different structure. So the informal workers and the informal economies, like small, as I said, food vendors, um, domestic workers, um, uh, construction workers, or uh, somebody who is, I don't know, uh, they are a seller in, in a market they all have their different functions. And the fact that they don't work for a large company does not make them any less valuable. And so um, it's just people have different ways of doing things. And I honestly, in, in my mind, I think that there's, it gives a lot more color. It gives them a lot of more character and actually also agility and strength in times of like 
COVID or when things go awry, who are the first ones to actually come back? Are they the big companies or are they the small peddlers? Like we just had a bomb blast and then there's already somebody selling fried rice at the side of the street. That's not going to happen with a big company. It'll take some time for them to get up. The fried rice seller is right there after less than an hour. And then so that kind of agility and then is, is really something that is quite, um, I think, inspirational. And um, it should not be looked upon as something of a lesser value. It's just a different value. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Zina, can you tell us more about the work that you do with migrant women and how these women innovate in the face of the fragile situations that they operate in? What do you mean by the micro women? Uh, hi, Sarah. I think the question was for me about migrant workers, women migrant oh, workers. My <laughs> so, <laughs> we also we the, also had experience with that. Really, the text is throwing me off. Now it's migrant yeah. workers and micro women. <laughs> <laughs> That's innovation there. <laughs> Actually, um, it's just really throwing me off. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Um, before I go on, I, I, I'd like to uh, not challenge the, the term, but uh, also like just put something out there uh, to reflect on is that we often tend to romanticize innovation, especially social innovation. Um, and there is a risk when uh, social innovation is expected to put pressure on individuals com to come up with solutions to resolve systemic problems. And that takes away the responsibility from the state to actually be proactive and resolve these problems. So I will definitely share up some uh, examples from the many uh, admiring steps that migrant domestic workers took during either during COVID or in other occasions. But it's also important to, to remember, like we should not uh, look at innovation only from that angle that it's something original, creative, that shows resilience um, without always linking it back to the responsibility of state organizations to provide, to address the root problems uh, and find solutions for them. So for migrant domestic workers, um, just to frame it in the context of Lebanon, where, uh, where I mainly focus, migrant domestic workers uh, work under a very specific uh, system, which is called a sponsorship system. In many countries in the world, when people migrate to work, they need a sponsor, right? But what's different here is that the migrant domestic worker cannot resign from their job or change an employer, except if the former employer agrees to that even when uh, he or she is abused. And I will use the term she because it's 99% women migrant domestic workers, not men in the domestic work sector. So when women migrant uh, domestic workers are in a vulnerable situation, trapped in a forced labor uh, situation, um, there is innovation in, on, on different levels. One on the, on the level of resilience, how do they manage either to survive an abusive relationship where they don't get paid sometimes for many months and that puts pressure on their families and their commitments back home. Um, they are trapped inside the house. They cannot have a vacation uh, nor on weekends nor uh, on any other holidays. So they work 365 days a year. And unfortunately to many people that culturally accepted. So that's a challenge. How to survive that, you know, like on a personal level requires a lot of strength and I think requires creativity. But more importantly, how do they network with each other despite these challenges? Like they are trapped in an isolated home and yet you can see them communicating uh, with each other or with someone that they see like a friendly face who can help them out of an abusive relationship through the balconies, through throwing uh, letters uh, from also from, from the street and so on. And some of the innovation at that level is how they can um, create awareness to each other. Like um, 
Sometimes domestic workers live in notes and in the mattress wherever she sleeps because they usually use specific rooms to sleep in. They are live in domestic workers, so they leave kind of a note to warn the next uh, worker because there is a probation period that this is a very abusive employer. So try to get out before you get trapped and so on. The manifestation of innovation was um, more visible beyond these individual examples um, during COVID. And when the economic crisis hit Lebanon very hard in 2019, and many of the workers in irregular situations found themselves out of job because of COVID, you know, like if you are a freelancer, people stopped, um, you know, uh, opening their houses to to each other and uh, and to strangers. So many migrant domestic workers uh, stopped having access to jobs, which means they ha ha could no longer afford rent or food and lost shelter. So the domestic workers found ways to network with each other, to impact the agenda of uh, NGOs and international organizations to shift funds around, to move from the development agenda into the humanitarian assistance so they could help each other. So this was um, a very interesting element, how they organized despite their all the challenges. You could see it, how they very easily became um, uh, Zoom literate and, you know, uh, the, the digital literacy of illiterate women. So many of these women are illiterate and yet very quickly they adapted to the online world. And because we work a lot on empowering migrant domestic workers and also beyond the issue of rights to kind of build their capacities on skills so they could find other opportunities when they go back to their countries. So the sessions could no longer happen physically, but online. And we thought that it would be a challenge and yet they were able to also kind of adapt and support each other into to integrate in these new tools. Um, mm -hmm. And Thank you. Oh. just I want to close that maybe the, the most innovative thing that I would think when it comes to migrant domestic workers is at the level of organizing. Mm -hmm. They are not, uh, they cannot organize because they are outside the protection of the labor law. And yet they do manage to form different associations um, and act collectively. And I think there's a lot of to learn from them on that. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Sarah, moving back to you, um, in your context, what outcomes would you like to see prioritized for informal workers and what innovations from other players outside of Rehab do you think can enable those to be achieved? So either on the local, national, or even international level, what would you like to, to see? What changes would you like to see? Mm. Specifically for informal workers in Indonesia, I mean, I think what, um, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely with, with, with protection of rights is definitely one of the things that do need to be improved because the condition that was just mentioned, like, that's just imprisonment, actually. <laughs> and, and forced, um, it's almost like human trafficking in a way. And so just like basic human rights, I think should be something that um, is, is more protected, that if it's factories, that they, it's actually humane, that it, whether it's domestic workers, that it's something that is humane. I think in terms of what is um, urgent would probably be that. I mean, uh, labor laws actually in Indonesia are very protective of workers. But then again, yeah, it's like if, if it's informal workers, then they're outside of that protection. Um, so, um, but uh, when I talk about informal workers, it's not just like those who are at working for someone else, but actually in majority in Indonesia, um, when I see informal workers is actually entrepreneurs. They're most of the informal workers that, we're that I was talking about, the majority in Indonesia, um, are not the ones working for larger companies, but it is actually the ones who are uh, entrepreneurs on their own. So uh, in that case, the, the humanitarian uh, protection is not an issue, but what is an issue is just like, um, like ensuring of enough income, 
ability to gain income. And um, I, I think like the spirit of inter entrepreneurship in Indonesia is quite uh, alive and well, but it would, um, so like I'm doing my part in terms of trying to address the payment side of it. But um, I think there's a lot that, that could be done, but like uh, I think what uh, you're saying about uh, that it's the government's responsibility. The thing is about Indonesia is we don't have much hope. <laughs> people are very, very, um, the good thing is that the people are very caring towards each other. I think Indonesia in one of the surveys is, uh, was um, from a survey was found out that it was the most generous country in the world. And people who even don't have anything always find something to give. So during COVID, like nobody waited for instructions from the government. And then they just like, everybody just like went out in droves and helped each other. And that's one of the things that I think I really love about Indonesia is that just spirit of um, helping one another. There's a word in Indonesian called gotong royong. And, um, we don't expect others to do it, but then we can do whatever we what we can. And and we saw that like really during COVID, it was just incredible. But even normal day to day, it's it's really if you go to Indonesia and then you ask for help, anybody people will always help you with the biggest smile, even though they have to go somewhere else. They would always say, and and it's it's that kind of spirit that instead of um, even though it's not their responsibility, people take responsibility upon themselves. And I think in terms of informal workers, it's always like, it's, it's the same as that, okay, um, we're responsible for ourselves, but then we're also responsible for each other. So there's, if you are within a community, um, even if, if things go bad, you will always help people to help you. And so at least even though there's no informal, uh, there no formal protection, there is actually quite great social informal protection and which is kind of ingrained in our culture. So that, that's the beautiful thing. It's like, we, we just, it, it's just part of it. But um, so there's, a, I guess a, a social, almost like a security system, but not from the government, but from your own neighbors and family. Um, but thank God for that. Otherwise, a lot of people would have a very hard time, but uh, at least in that. But definitely if it's in former workers that are, that have employers, humanitarian rights, I agree, is the number one issue. Just making sure that they have something that is, they're not exposed to toxic waste or things that would actually be very detrimental to them. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And uh, Isina, going back to you, what do you think is missing in the equation for these women um, to be recognized for their work? So for domestic work specifically, for domestic workers specifically, there's uh, the gender lens. I mean, if you look historically, uh, domestic work is considered to be a, a job to be done by women. It's unpaid uh, care work, and uh, it has been outside the scope of uh, labor protection for so long all over the world. Until recently, in 2011, there was an international convention calling for decent work for domestic workers, and things started to change in many parts of the world but still there's a long, long way to go. So the recognition of domestic work as work, uh, one uh, starting point. Um, but beyond that, um, I think to prevent vulnerability for women from going into the informal sector, there's also oh, education, education, education. Whether education in terms of uh, fighting illiteracy, which is, again, if we look at budgets of development organization, organizations, um, the attention to illiteracy is uh, has been decreasing over the years. And this is alarming because also it affects women more than uh, men. Um, also about uh, long life learning. 
and skinning after maternity protection. You know, like you need the maternity protection, but also if women want to go back to, to, to certain jobs, sometimes they lose the skills and you need um, those empowerment tools to be integrated within the systems. And I understand what Sarah is saying and I appreciate that, that solidarity within the communities is very important and it provides, you know, like the basic to survive uh, and to be content. But we should never, ever give up on the responsibility of the state institutions to have all those these protection entrenched and accessible to all. Because protection is not just about have access to a loan, have access to, um, uh, to health. There are multi layers that characterize the informality. Uh, if there is a complaint between with, with the employer, there's no one who can properly represent them because they would be afraid to raise a case because they are in the informal sector. There are, there are no laws and regulations that uh, actually define that employment relationship. So it becomes, you know, a unbalanced power between the employer and the worker. All of these are you switch it around, you want to change them. If you want to look for a solution, it's education, it's skilling, it's protection um, under, the, under uh, the labor law, it's social protection, because if we look also, um, it's very alarming how many migrant women who, after they retire, they find themselves without savings, jobless, without any kind of protection, and they are elderly at, uh, at an age where they need care. So. All of these are, are important to address. Add to that the gender dimension, where the burden of care remains on women in, in many uh, countries. So it adds another layer of burden on, on the migrant domestic workers. So rethink this uh, issue of, uh, of care. It's, of course, in some countries, it's more advanced than others. But this is, again, why we need more feminist women decision-making, whether a man or a woman, when they come to a certain decision-making position, it's very important to understand the risk of patriarchy and how that impacts men and women, um, you know, at policy level, at access to job markets. You need all of these narrative shift to remove the stigma from the low-skilled works. As Sarah mentioned, the, these are workers who contribute to society. It's, this is how the society functions. They are not less valued than others, but we need to remove the stigma uh, from them and to link them to more protection. Thank you so much. Um, so now we will move on uh, to the Q&A section. We actually have uh, quite a few questions from our audience. So I'll pass it to the public as well. Um, thank you so much, Sarah and Dana, um, for your unique perspective. We appreciate that many um, uh, and I'll be um, asking a bunch of questions <laughs> on behalf of um, the attendees. Um, we do have about 45 questions, so um, if you could keep the answers to about three minutes, um, then maybe we'd be able to take most of them. Um, so this is to Sarah. Um, mm -hmm. The question says, um, what is the language of communication through the CAPE's digital system? of transaction, um, giving the diversity in, in Indonesia, um, how to, um, this is the second question, I guess you can take them both. Um, the second question is, um, how do companies that are on bank pay taxes or do they? Um, thank you in advance. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so yes, there's a diversity of Indonesia. There's about 750 languages throughout Indonesia. But everybody is teaching, it, it speaks Indonesian as, uh, as usually a second language. So actually Indonesia is the country with the largest, um, largest uh, percentage of trilinguals in the world uh, because they have their own, um, uh, uh, their own, uh, we, we, so the language within that area and then they learn Indonesian uh, almost as soon as possible, uh, like first, second grade of school, they would already speak Indonesian. And then uh, also then with English, but then Indonesian is the unifying language throughout. So then we just use Indonesian and that covers pretty much almost 100%, 90, 
probably 99% of Indonesia. In terms of the unbanked, uh, if they don't have, mostly they, uh, a lot of them don't pay taxes uh, because they don't even qualify for the, um, the level uh, that is taxed. Um, in many cases, um, that's the case, but then there's also for um, the ones who are somewhat relatively bigger, but they're still part of the informal, uh, the tax uh, authorities have like a um, limit in terms of the revenue for a company. So I think it's uh, 600 million rupiah, which is, I don't know, Ma, can you divide that 600 million divided of 15,000, how many dollars is that? And then, so if it if their uh, annual sales, so let's say if they're an entrepreneur and if their annual sales is less than six hundred million rupiah, or do you have a number? What do you count it? Huh? That's six hundred thousand divided by fifteen thousand. That gives us no, no, six hundred thousand divided by fifteen thousand. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Million, so 600 million divided by 15,000. Yeah, yeah, it's it's midnight here, so I am not functioning, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 40,000. Huh? 40,000. Okay, so if their sales is less than 40,000, if the company's sales is less than 40,000 within a year, then um, they just pay like, I think 1% of, of that. So yeah, uh, regardless of whatever the cost structure is, but if they hit a 40,000 uh, income, then they would have to pay taxes of 1% times whatever that amount. Uh, if it's, it's not above, sorry, below 40,000. If it's below 40,000, it's just like 1% times whatever it is. So they don't even bother to look at it. But then only if it's bigger than $40,000, then they would have to do the whole tax calculation. So that's kind of like the major, just like easy rule. But in many cases, they don't even need the qualifications to buy to, to pay taxes. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, to Zena, um, the question for you is um, how you would describe the vulnerability of um, well, I mean, technically, I guess you've touched on it, so I'll get to the next part. Um, how would you, so it, it's a bit difficult to talk about fragility in today's context without sort of looking at climate vulnerability and impacts and how those interact people operating in different spaces. Um, are there like any linkages between like climate change, climate vulnerability, climate impacts um, that you'd like to sort of underscore um, in terms of the context of your work, if you will. Yeah. You might have interrupted a bit, but uh, just to quickly reinterpret the question. So you're asking if there are uh, how climate change and uh, some other vulnerabilities at origin countries can impact uh, migrant workers? Yes, you will. Um, yeah. Like yeah, no, of course. I mean, no, this is very important because, again, if we put this, if we frame this uh, under the SDGs, we can see very clearly all the linkages, right? So with climate change and how it's impacting all the agrarian communities, uh, that's also where women are losing their jobs as in, in agriculture or they are losing their livelihood and they are pushed to migrate even when they don't want to. So the climate change has a direct impact on uh, not only on um, the decision to migrate, but also where to migrate, because sometimes they have little opportunities where to go, so they would just go. Um, and another thing is, again, going back to the gender issue, sometimes uh, women migrate because there are no uh, gender protection in, in, uh, in their communities, uh, away from gender-based violence or uh, a lack of uh, <clears throat> proper economic uh, cap ca opportunities for women in countries of origin. So, and when the, cl the climate change and how it's impacting 
many uh, developing countries, it's also reshifting all this labor force and it's creating more migration into, uh, into environments where decent work is not guaranteed. And uh, I was looking at the questions and um, I agree with Nalini that there is little innovation in survival right? Because if whatever I described was kind of examples of how women migrant domestic workers deal uh, when they are in a distressed situation, when they are in an abuse uh, situation, and they can only rely on their creativity because unfortunately there is little support mechanism around them. You have uh, more proactive uh, perhaps NGOs, some uh, association formed by migrant workers, but the systems itself are not being um, are not evolving with the very fast changes that is happening at the global level, uh, whether it's because of climate change or whether because of unemployment and uh, also the aftermath of COVID, and all of that have impact directly on migrant uh, migrant workers and specifically migrant domestic workers. I hope I answered the question, which I didn't hear very well. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it was. Um, sort of very valuable for you to bring the social um, aspects to bear. Because a lot of times when we talk about kind of vulnerabilities and impact, we tend to focus more on like economic shocks and you know sort of the ripple effects that economic inequality um, has on that dynamic. So thank you very much. Um, question for Sarah. Um, how easy is it for um, small businesses in the informal economy within the context to get loans? Um, do cooperatives play a huge role in access to these loans? Hmm. So um, it's very easy to get it, but at what cost? So if it's just to get a loan, there are very, very willing loan sharks that um, can give you within, uh, within the day uh, a loan, but with potentially one to 3% of uh, interest per day. So you can imagine like how, like what, how are you ever going to return it if it is at that level? So if, if it's one to 3% per day, just like stupid math is 30% um, to 90% within a month. If you, if you borrow a hundred dollars by the end of the month, you have to, pay 200, almost. So almost $200, it's, it's at 90%, so you pay about 180. But um, if it is, but actually there are a lot of um, like small business um, loans that have a very low uh, rate um, well, low for Indonesia is like about already like 6% per year. For Indonesia, that's already extremely low. Uh, mind you, we have a higher inflation of 7 to 10%. So 6% is already extremely low, but those kind of loans are hard to get. Um, yes, uh, so there would be a lot of uh, things that you'd have to fulfill you'd have to have this and that. And in many cases, the people that it's targeted for actually do not have it. In terms of cooperatives, yes, they are also, uh, they are actually a major player, I think, in the informal uh, lending. Um, but um, it depends, some cooperatives have good, but it's still relatively higher. Probably like within a year, it would be 30% could be even higher than 30% per year interest rate. Um, but that's still a lot very better than 30% in a month, right? Um, but then there, it also depends on the cooperative. Some actually function well, but quite frankly, a lot of them actually, it's only as good as the leader. Uh, so in many cases, uh, uh, so in Indonesia, it's called KUD, Koprasi Unitesa. So it's like the cooperative of the village. But then people have a saying of KUD actually says, Ketua Untung Duluan. And in Indonesian, that means the leader is the one who benefits first. 
Yeah. So um, it's an, a cooperative is only as good as its leader and its members. So some of them actually give pretty good uh, loans and give opportunities to their members, but in some cases they're just they're just as bad as loan sharks. So it depends. Right. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, our last question for Dina. Um, the attendee um, of what class says, innovation is often considered something new, not thought of, or and never been done before. It's often external, involving some technical um, or no transfers. Do you think that some grassroots or community-led innovation um, is being overlooked? And in what ways do you think we might elevate it? Well, thank you for this question. It, it was actually the heart of my thesis. <laughs> I was just <laughs> submitted a thesis on uh, social innovation for sustainable development. And um, the idea that innovation is only something new and external, um, it should be challenged by itself because there's also um, disregarded methods in community approach that did work in the past. And by going after innovation, sometimes we forget what works and we try to reinvent the wheel. I give you just a, like an example, you can research it later, the Ubuntu uh, philosophy, the Ubuntu approach in, in Africa, which uh, builds uh, community development based on empathy, based on voice of the community, based on the meeting the social needs of the community, with by, by engaging expert opinion as well. So uh, the definition of um, innovation is something to, is, is a quasi definition, right? It's not something that we can find and we can all uh, agree on, but definitely uh, the grassroots way of innovating and interacting with each other uh, and identifying the problems, connecting the root problem to each other. And again, holding those responsible accountable um, is something that uh, is quite needed today if we want to look at all the global challenges. Um, and I feel again, the, this, this is why we are here. It's about to, to not only to reinvent the wheel and to look for something new, but how to um, connect what worked in the past with digital, uh, the digitalization, with all the new tools that we have today and bring them together to address the systemic uh, challenges that we see in the world. Thank you very much, um, Dana. Um, to wrap up the Q and A, um, I have like a question for both of you, and you can just just want to listen a minute. Um, uh, Sarah, you can go first. But then the question is, um, what keeps you inspired um, to keep going on with your work? Can you say that again? What keeps you inspired to keep going on with the work that you do? Um, for me. Uh, <laughs> the problem's still there. People are still actually, so um, I think it was mentioned that um, I, I manage a $600 million grant to reduce poverty in Indonesia. The reason I founded WITAPE is that the only way we could figure out how, we tr we had the bank with the Rajas Network, but we had to actually can carry sacks of money to, and, and, and give to people. I just thought that was insane. So I'm doing what I, I I've resigned from my position. I found a good topic to create a system. So now we have, we're able to do that. We can do it. We can digitize anything anywhere. However, the majority of people who don't use us are still going around carrying cash. So the problem is still very prevalent. Um, and now for us, it's it's how to get our solution to scale and make that as the norm and the standard. So that's what, that's my um, personal thing that we have to do is, is as long as there's still a problem, there's still um, meaning to why I'm here and trying to do. So basically, hopefully that it will no longer be a problem in the future. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um... We're inspired by your work, and I personally would, you know, stay in touch with the happy journey. Um, Zena, what's going on? Well, for me, I think um, nature, 
because when I look at the harmony of nature and how it survives despite every, everything we do to it, uh, I find inspiration in that and how can we borrow and learn from nature into our human interaction. Um, my son, who's a child with big dreams and big aspirations, and I feel more than inspiration and responsibility uh, to at least transfer this knowledge, this passion to him without imposing it on him so he can fly wherever he wants to go. And more importantly, the, the people that I get, I interact with. I mean, there's a lot of inspiration in the stories, the good, the bad, the survivals. The, 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 there's really so much knowledge to gain when we listen to the people that we work with rather than just stay behind our screens and computers. And um, that's inspiration. And the challenges themselves, as Sarah said, there's so much to do is like, Sometimes you can't afford to stop and think. It's uh, something leads to another, and we're always trying to find ways to to address problems, find new techniques, go back to the old, and uh, this is how it is. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, handing this back to Julia. Yes. Well, uh, we're at the end of our panel again. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I thought this conversation was great. It's very challenging. Um, it was great to have, you know, you coming from different backgrounds and sharing different experiences, but it's it's good to see how some situations might be, might be different, but the core of what people want to do, how people want to improve other people's lives, their communities, that's there and that's the same everywhere. And I think that's, something that inspires me, right? Um, so again, thank you so much for our panelists. Thank you so much for the people that join us online and the people that join us in person today. And I hope everyone had a great evening.